Hello, everyone. I'm Warwick Saban, Executive Director of the Society of Fellows, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this SOF digital discussion. We were planning to host this program in person here in Washington, D.C. at this exact time, and I know all of us wish we could be together in person, but with continued concern about the Delta variant, we pivoted to this virtual format. However, our next several events in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York City are still going forward in person. So please continue to check your email for all of the information and updates about our upcoming activities around the country, which will also be live streamed and recorded so you can see them no matter where you are located. And today we're pleased to welcome a dynamic and expert panel who will help us understand the current state of US Middle East relations 20 years after the events of September 11th. Vali Nasser is a professor of international affairs and Middle East studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and he served as the Dean of that school from 2012 to 2019. From 2009 to 2011, he was the Senior Advisor to Ambassador Richard Holbrook, who was the US Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Barbara Slavin is the Director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. She's also a lecturer in international affairs at George Washington University. She wrote the 2007 book, Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the US and the Twisted Path to Confrontation and she is a regular commentator on US foreign policy and Iran. Robin Wright is a journalist and author, as well as a joint fellow at the US Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson International Center. She has reported for more than 140 countries on six continents for many major publications. And she's written nine books, including Rock the Casbah, Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World, which won the 2012 Overseas Press Club Award for best book on international affairs. And this conversation will be moderated by Yara Bayumi, who is the World and National Security Editor for Opinion at the New York Times. Previously, she was Deputy International Editor at NPR, and before that, she was Senior Editor at The Atlantic and the Deputy National Security Editor at Reuters. And as with all of our SOF digital discussions, the panelists will be glad to answer your questions after the initial conversation, and you could submit your questions anytime by simply clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and typing them in. And if you encounter any problems at all during the event, please email the SOF hotline and our team will be glad to assist you. So now our panelists will be in conversation for the first 45 minutes, and then I will pose your questions to them for the rest of the event. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Yara Bayumi. Yara? Hi, Warwick. Thanks so much uh, for these really kind introductions. I'm really happy to be here to be uh, moderating this discussion, and I'm looking forward to having a really dynamic conversation because while we had scheduled this um, quite a while ago, I don't think it had been before um, the dramatic events uh, that, we, that we saw in Afghanistan unfold. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's also a sort of an apt moment um, because we did hear uh, President Biden speak at UNGA earlier this week. And that's actually what I want to um, kick off the discussion with. Um, and we'll take it from there. So I just want to read a few points um, that President Biden, uh, that President Biden made. He said that, um, you know, the U.S. is at an inflection point or we rather are at an inflection point in history. Um, instead of and instead of continuing to fight the wars of the past, we are fixing our eyes on devoting resources to the challenges that hold the keys to our collective future. He also said, as we close this period of relentless war, we're opening a new era of relentless diplomacy, of using the power of our development aid to invest in new ways of lifting people around the world and of renewing and defending democracy. So, Valley, why don't you kick us off? Do you think this is um, the beginning or the outlines of a so-called Biden doctrine? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Yara, and, and thanks to uh, Society of Fellows for inviting me, and it's great to be on this panel with Barbara and, and Robin. Uh, I do think it is an inflection point. I do think this president is somewhat determined to right-size American foreign policy and, and, and focus it on Asia in a definitive way. Uh, this is a trend that we saw start with President Obama, it, it gained uh, momentum under President Trump. And now I think President Biden is not only doubling down on it, but is actually trying to give it much more of a structure 
and 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 show that we mean business you know as we're drawing in Af from afghanistan on the other hand forming this uh, new sets of alliances in asia from the AUKUS with australia uk to the quad uh, it, it, this is all real, and I, and I do think he sees this as, as an important contribution that he has to make. It, it is a, a way of sort of reducing emphasis on the Middle East, which uh, has, has consumed a lot of our attention, uh, and focusing it on, on, on China and, and on uh, Asia. I think there are holes here, uh, namely, I think there's a discrepancy between uh, the way in which we're leading the Middle East and, and not having quite uh, convinced people that we can do it in a, in a way that is not disruptive. I mean, Afghanistan was not the best way of showing that we can leave the region without causing more trouble. Uh, I think the Iran deal is still sitting there. It's, uh, it's uh, probably the one issue that could end up in a serious uh, crisis in the region. And uh, the uh, and the administration has not uh, not all entirely its fault, but it does have a role to to play in the fact that there is no deal. And then there's a whole set of other issues uh, from Iraq to Syria to Libya, etc., that are there, and we still don't know how exactly are we going to deprioritize the Middle East without having a clear path there. And then you know the administration talks about, uh, and I'll end with this about. Um, Diplomacy, but it really has not pr provided, uh, you know, the great deal of confidence in that it's doing this in the right way. I mean, this whole spat with France may seem silly to some people, but it's not understandable to me why this the phone call and the and the and the outreach to the French could not have ha could not have happened before we announced the deal. Uh, it's not that the French. It's not just that the French uh, lost sixty billion dollars and and feel slighted. It's just that they weren't even consulted, and uh, they weren't even told that that this was coming. And and I and I think it says something about, you know, what really are thinking about multilateralism is is alliance management is. So there are still quirks in the system that I hope they will they will be able to iron out. But I think the general direction is that we are shifting from chasing terrorists to great power politics, and that we are. This is a, re, a moment in which American foreign policy is reorienting itself with all that that might need. Right, and I definitely want to get into uh, the the issues a little bit more substanti substantively, um, and we, we will get to those. But but just before we kind of do that, I wanted to um, spend just a little bit more time about the, the the sort of overall challenge that the U.S. faces. And and Robin, you wrote a really thoughtful uh, piece about Biden's speech, and in it you say, you know, the words were welcome, but there are lingering issues of credibility regarding America and its new president and its new president's leadership. So, just sort of expanding on what Valley said there, could you elaborate a little bit more about where those issues of credibility are going to, you know? you know, come up against the Biden administration and particularly with regards to the Middle East? Well, Joe Biden is clearly the most experienced uh, American president in history when it comes to foreign policy. The problem is he has not created the kind of momentum that a lot of leaders had hoped. And whether it's the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which the United States decided in terms of timing unilaterally without bringing together the NATO allies who, who had agreed in principle, but this, you know, took, this really knocked them uh, for a loop. Uh, then to be followed by the very clumsy, one of the clumsiest acts by American president of the 21st century in doing a deal with Britain and Australia without ever informing the French. And one of the striking things about Biden and Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, is that they have behaved almost, behaved almost as lovers when it came to the G7 conference, walking arm in arm along um, the boardwalk of the Atlantic and, the, and Cornwall and uh, tweeting about each other and so forth. And Biden was already doing the deal, according to the French, at that moment, uh, doing the deal with the British and the Australians without notifying the French at that time. And so for the French, it's not the issue of, as Vali said, the $66 billion. It's really far more about the rules-based order and the fact that we have a Western alliance that has been the anchor uh, 
for the last 70 years for all of us in the West. And there's a sense at the moment that the United States is not acting in a way that makes this uh, alliance more cohesive, more collaborative, when it comes to take, taking on the challenges of the 21st century for what's happened in the last two decades. And I would just close by saying, when you look at the issue that got us into Afghanistan, it is today more pervasive around the world than it was um, when it was centered in, whether it was Afghanistan or Beirut, where, where it, there were centers. And today we find that it is all over the world, you know, on four continents at least with supporters on all six inhabited continents. And I just, one little anecdote, I was in Mozambique for independence in 1975. This is a country bordering South Africa with a 60% Christian population. And in August, the Biden administration had to sanction ISIS in Mozambique, which shows you the breadth of the evolution of jihadism. So while the administration really does intend to try to move to Asia, it has so many of the issues of the past still lingering that the danger is that we continue to be reactive rather than proactive in taking on, in carving out the kind of um, institutions or principles that will help us do that big pivot and engage in the kind of great power competition that Vali outlined. Right, so I just wanna pick up um, on something that you said there, which is um, even though the administration is trying to move to Asia, it still has so many issues of the past, like setting aside the jihadism issue for one moment, um, as Vali had mentioned, you know, the Iran nuclear deal is sort of the, 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 the maybe the, the most li quote unquote live issue right now. Um, in the region that maybe has the potential to combust or, you know, if we are more optimistic, has the potential to um, to sort of conclude in a more um, productive or pro positive kind of way. Barbara, you obviously follow this issue very, very closely. Um, and I know it's been a bit stop and start um, since the Biden administration came in and, of course, the new Iranian elections as well. But where do you see, you know, if we're going to get into issues, let's get into the Iran nuclear deal. Where do you see those standing, those negotiations standing right now? Well, they're on pause still. They have been since June. Uh, you know, the uh, system decided that it wanted to ensure that Ibrahim Raisi became the president of Iran and that there would be nothing that would get in the way. So. They disqualified uh, any candidate that could possibly compete with him and also made sure that there was no re-entry into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that would create any enthusiasm among the populace before those elections. Uh, the new government is taking its sweet time about returning to talks. There had been some anticipation that there would at least be preliminary conversations on the sidelines of the UN uh, General Assembly this week, and that doesn't appear to be happening. Um, I'm not quite ready to bury this thing. Uh, you know, I'm already hearing talk in Washington. We're certainly hearing it from the Israelis about a plan B and people quite willing to jettison this whole thing, which took uh, 12 years, frankly, to, to produce. If you look at all the negotiations that went into it, I'm not quite ready to do that yet. I still think that the government of Iran understands that even if it's doing its own pivot to Asia and in particular has very close ties with China, it would still benefit from sanctions relief, from a lifting of US secondary sanctions. So I think they will get back to talks. Um, you know, there's a lot of gamesmanship going on now. We're hearing comments from some of the American negotiators suggesting basically we have till the end of the year and we can't do this forever because Iran is making uh, additional progress in its nuclear program. Um, but I think that there is still uh, an interest on all sides in the international community. Uh, in the P5, uh, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council uh, plus Germany to return to this, uh, this agreement. Whether it will lead to anything more is, is another question, frankly, given the nature of this current Iranian administration. I don't think we can expect uh, much beyond the JCPOA if we are lucky enough to get that back. Right, so I guess we'll have to stay tuned. Do we... They haven't even decided when the next talks are, right? The next stage, yeah. Okay. No, so, um, in Vienna, but they haven't set a date. Yeah. 
Um, so besides besides the you know the Iran nuclear deal, I wanted to talk um, a little bit more broadly as well about sort of the the changing dynamics in the region as well, right? Like the the Middle East that the U that the U.S. faced 20 years ago is in also in the midst of a of a realliance of some sort. You know, it like was really convulsed also, especially in the last. Um, five years over the Trump administration as well. And we are now seeing sort of a new a new realignment, so to speak, um, primarily in between um, the Saudis and, and the Iranians as well. Does that in any way, does that provide an opportunity for the Biden administration, especially again, as we're saying, as it seeks to um, de 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 decrease its its you know so called involve like so in deep involvement in the region and do its pivot to Asia. Uh, Valley and Barbara, do you each want to take uh, I don't know the Saudi side, the Iranian side, maybe? Valley, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I, I mean, yes, it's it's promising in the sense that uh, the two were not talking at all, and and the Saudis that they, they don't have an embassy, and and the relations have been pretty bad, and. Uh, during the Trump administration, there was an attack on uh, Saudi oil facilities. Uh, Iran is supporting Houthis uh, in, in Yemen. Uh, uh, the Saudis are worried about now increasing drone and other attacks coming uh, from Iraq. Uh, so, so the relations have been really bad. And then the fact that actually they're meeting and they're meeting at a very high level. And I believe in it, even here in New York, there has been a foreign minister's meeting, which is, again, pretty important. So this is all progress. And, and I do think we're seeing a very different tune coming out of Washington, which is which is good, which unlike the Trump administration, which forbade the, the Arabs from talking to Iran and wanted to isolate Iran. I think this administration is more of a view that uh, diplomacy is a good thing. Uh, Qataris and UAE and Saudi Arabia should bury the hatchet. The Turks and, and, and the Persian Gulf Emirates should bury the hatchet. And, and, and above all, Iran and and the Arabs should talk, uh, even if they can't get to a complete normalization, at least a uh, reduction of, te uh, of, of, of the heightened tensions, the fact that the Saudis may not be facing an imminent threat, et cetera. These are all good things. Uh, the, the problem uh, is that uh, it's not showing uh, what is it that the United, where does the United States see this ending? So if you're uh, Iranians, of course, you want you want a certain degree of normalization, at least in the short run, uh, because you don't want Saudi Arabia and UAE to be a lobby against the nuclear deal in Washington like they were the last time. But if you're these Arab countries, I think they are they are in a bit of a shell shocked uh, situation because they saw the United States leave uh, Afghanistan in a very sort of a cold and and clinical way, basically saying we're done, our strategy has changed. We taught them to swim, and if they're sinking, that's their own fault. It's not our fault that they didn't, they can't defend themselves. Well, you know, that's not a worry. That's not a really reassuring message to all these uh, Persian Gulf Emirates who are very dependent on U.S. military support, and and uh, are are de are definitely trying uh, trying to find a way to to stabilize their situation, and then uh, also uh, they don't know what the fate of the nuclear deal is. Because if there is a nuclear deal, if, as Barbara said, they meet again, there is a breakthrough, as slim as chance as that is, that we're going to have a very different Middle East. And what if the nuclear deal doesn't happen and Iran ends up under Chapter 7 sanctions and they, and, and they begin to escalate pressure in, in Iraq and Syria, et cetera? Can there be an Arab-Iranian rapprochement then? I mean, uh, you know, we, uh, so so I think we're we're in a very interesting place in the Middle East. Definitely, after t uh, over forty years of the United States being the military backbone of this region to contain Iran, all of a sudden the U.S. is systematically withdrawing, and the Iranians obviously stepping into the vacuum. Uh, the, the Arabs don't don't are not able to push them back on on their own. And, and, and it's not clear whether the United States is committed to any kind of a particular balance of power uh, in the region. So, so this is a fraught moment. I, I, I don't see a clear direction going, other than the fact that it's good that they're talking to each other. Barbara, do you think there's an opportunity for Iran there in its um, sort of, you know, tepid maybe um, uh, efforts so far in 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 sort of regional reconciliation to to kind of use that to their advantage as well? Have we seen beyond the talks that are happening 
any actual concrete evidence of like the tensions being lowered. I mean, I feel like I don't keep a super close eye, but I still, for instance, see that we are still seeing Houthi attacks um, in Yemen on a pretty regular basis. Um, the situation, you know, Syria is still, you know, I mean, they are still a dominant force in Syria and that does, you know, they have not obviously changed their strategy there either. So just curious to how they may be, how you think they may be calculating that. Yeah, look, it, it, as Vali said, it's very good that, that, you know, these talks are happening. I think the next round of these talks are going to be in Jordan, which will be interesting. Uh, not a traditional ally of Iran, that's for sure. And it was their King Abdullah who invented this idea of the Shia Crescent, I think even before you did, Vali. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good, obviously, that they're talking. But um, you know, Iran, Iran has benefited so much from the mistakes of others, uh, going all the way back to 1982 in the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which helped produce Hezbollah, going, you know, further on into, of course, the Iraq invasion, which opened up Iraq to all of this Iranian influence, and Iran is so entrenched there now. Iran is in Syria, Iran is in Lebanon, and Iran is in Yemen. And, 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 you know, they also, the Iranians maintain a certain kind of plausible deniability because groups like the Houthis, while they have become much closer to Iran uh, over the years, uh, certainly since the Saudis made the mistake of getting into a war with them in 2015, um, the Houthis uh, are not Iranian proxies. They are uh, on the march. They're doing very well. Nobody's paying much attention, but I believe they are still taking more territory in Yemen. And they feel like uh, history is on their side. And even if, even if the Iranians told them to, to cut it out, I'm not sure that they would. They have plenty of weapons. I'm sure they've learned how to make these rockets and drones on their own now. And uh, they are continuing to attack Saudi Arabia because there's still a blockade uh, of Sana'a and I believe of the, the major port in Yemen. Um, and so they're gonna continue this fight no matter what the Iranians say. Uh, you know, you can't you can't unwind all of this. These are these are developments that have been, in some cases, forty years in the making. And uh, even though Iran may not seem to be a terribly successful country in terms of its own domestic situation, externally it has been very effective in spreading its influence throughout the region. And and talks with Saudi Arabia, you know, they're not going to change that. Right. So that's something else um, that we will have to look for look look at i mean i i'm i'm generally curious to see w how these talks sort of manifest in a way like in a concrete way and i and it hasn't been quite clear to me yet how they have though yes in general it's always um good to talk um but to pivot a little bit to robin and i want to pick up on that note that you said on on jihadism right because that is still um, even if the Biden administration is saying it is moving away from like this, uh, this, this national security focus on the idea of the forever wars, the war on terror, like the fight against um, militancy, that is still a very, very live issue um, in, in the Middle East and like in some theaters more than others, but for a lot of other countries as well in the region, it is a either um, an actual threat in the sense of, you know, there is an active presence of, um, of militant groups, whether that is in Syria or in Iraq. Um, and it is also, I mean, I think worth pointing out that, you know, other countries who, you know, are ostensibly US allies, but use the idea of the threat of, of militancy as a way to crack down at home and cement a lot of power as well. How does the U.S. reckon with that now in the region, with these two challenges? Well, it's obviously the big challenge for the Biden administration, especially after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the last attack on what it claimed was uh, an ISIS car. And of course, it turned out to be 10 civilians. U.S. strategy is now going to be based on over the horizon when it comes to dealing with groups like ISIS. Uh, and its many franchises, which are dotted across North Africa and the Middle East now, and South Asia. So I think that's going to be a real challenge. But remember, we're dealing with different kinds of jihadim, jihadism, and you have the, the brand of ISIS, then you have uh, Al-Qaeda, and these are fundamental rivals. And then you have what 
you know, we call jihadists at the time of the Iranian revolution, the kind of fundamentalists who emerged and the kind of alliance that Iran has built up. You mentioned earlier the, um, the Abraham Accords and the fact that you now have five Arab countries that have some kind of arrangement with Israel, some kind of recognition. It still leaves 18, but it is showing the shift in the region. At the same time, you have Iran, which has built its so-called uh, resistance alliance that has, uh, has its tentacles every place. And not only as allies, but having deployed missiles and drones in all of these countries that can much more easily target Israel or other Iranian adversaries than Iran can. And so you have all these proxies. So there are lots of different layers of Islamist activity or uh, Islamist politics, but virtually every country in the Middle East, and we're talking about two dozen, have some element of jihadi or political Islam or um, in the, and it, the full spectrum. You know, they're not all extremists. Some of them are um, like Inada in Tunisia are trying to work within the system, but Tunisia also has a, a, a jihadi group to deal with as well. And so the, there are these pockets. And I think the one danger is that the United States increasingly relies on the autocrats of the region, the dictators, notably in, in whether it's Egypt or the Persian Gulf, to base its military so that it can carry out these over the horizon attacks on jihadis, whether they're, the, whether they're ISIS in, in Iraq or uh, Afghanistan or you know, the kind of special operations the United States has carried out in parts of Africa. So I, I think this is a really hard moment uh, when we're withdrawing and we are seen to be withdrawing and many of these groups actually believe that they are winning and they have uh, achieved a kind of military balance that, uh, that is to their advantage rather than to ours. So ha given, I mean, given that and given what the administration um, is saying its priority is going to be uh, foreign policy wise, national security wise, where, I mean, I'm, cur I'm curious to, to, to sort of untangle a bit, like where does the Middle East fit in that equation? Like what does the relationship with the United States become? Uh, does it become that, that will allow the U.S. to kind of really fully do the pivot that, it, uh, you know, pivot to Asia that it really wants to do and deal with the great power competition that it really uh, feels it wants to put most of its, uh, you know, muscular sort of energy, energy towards? And um, does it become this issue of, you know, we, we, we sort of have our main priorities. We just need to make sure that none of these, you know, for the jihadist threats, none of these groups have to, like, will be a direct threat um, to the United States. But it doesn't really matter to us anymore how, you know, how these countries um, and their leaderships will control or will, will get these groups, um, you know, under control. If that means that there will be uh, that there will be a reliance on auto on autocrats and autocratic practices, then so be it. How does that square with another main tenet of the Biden administration's foreign policy agenda, which ostensibly is that it's a human rights um, <laughs> approach? Uh, who wants to take that first? I'm, Arba, I'm, you want to go? Yes, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. You know, there's hypocrisy in American foreign policy. Um, no, look, it's very contradictory. And, uh, and you know, all this talk of human rights and meanwhile, the poor women of Afghanistan are back under their burqas. Uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't really mesh together. Um, I, I get the sense though, I think a lot of people do that, that after 20 years, basically, you know, the Biden administration, very similar really to Trump in a way, just wants the Middle East to go away and leave it alone for a little while uh, because we've had it, you know, we've had it. Now we still have a lot of troops in the region. I think we still have 50,000 troops on all of these various bases. I don't know how many of those will, will be pulled back or whether many of them will, will stay. Um, we have bases in Qatar, in Bahrain, we have uh, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, I think still, maybe not in Saudi Arabia anymore. 
And Israel now has become part of central command, which is something new. So it used to be that Israel was part of the European command. Um, will we subcontract more to the Israelis? That will be interesting. Or to the Israelis and the Emiratis together? That's possible. Um, but really, I think uh, Biden wants to focus primarily on domestic issues, on the economy, on climate, on building back better from COVID. And uh, yes, there's a pivot to Asia because we're worried about China. We have to keep an eye on China. But I really, I really think the last thing he wants is to be is to be stuck in the Middle East. And uh, I was having a conversation with some people about Iran. You know, there are people pushing covert action against Iran's nuclear program and trying to drag us back into a confrontation there if the JCPOA is not revived. And I just don't think Biden's heart uh, is in that. So just if I may, just to build on what Barbara was yeah, saying, please do. I, would say, I would say there are three things to, to keep in mind. One is that I think during the President Trump's administration, the, the civil military balance in the U.S. shifted in a very important way. That, that Trump, uh, uh, because of the peculiarities of his control over Republican Party and his character, he asserted civilian domination over the military in a way that hadn't been the case since 9-11. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that has opened the door to challenge some of what was traditionally neoconservative assumptions about military uh, dominance, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, when I worked for Richard Holbrook, uh, you couldn't say talking to the Taliban. The word talking to the Taliban could be nowhere near the White House because the president could not be even seen to hear uh, the idea of talking to terrorists. And yet Trump not only talked to them, but he invited them to Camp David. Uh, and and uh, so, so that, that's an important shift that's happened. So the military has lost its ability to argue American geo strategy in the manner that it had done before. Secondly, you know, Biden himself, even during the uh, Obama administration, was of the view that terrorism can be managed through aggressive counterterrorism strategy, which means special forces. And it, at that point, was drones. Now they call it over the horizon things. And everything else we did in the Middle East had nothing to do with defeating or containing terrorists. In other words, we, we destroyed Al-Qaeda because we disrupted their finances, we captured and killed their leaders, we hounded them. Everything else we did in Afghanistan, in, in Biden's uh, opinion, was irrelevant to, to uh, the, the destruction of Al-Qaeda. So personally, he's of the belief that you know what, what uh, Robin described is a viable strategy, that we could... We could, uh, we could have a much more light foot uh, management of, of, of terrorism, and we don't need to have hundreds of thousands of troops there. Although, as I said, you know, the management of the Iran issues, to me, is problematic because this issue may keep us in the region, and it's not a terrorism, it's not an Al-Qaeda issue. It's, it's a very different beast that, that uh, if you're not careful, can, can, can entangle you. But, but And then the third issue is, is something that actually uh, General Mattis wrote, again, during um, the Trump administration, the first national defense strategy in a decade, in which he, who had been the commander of CENTCOM and had been a commander in Iraq, wrote a document saying that America sh has to shift its focus from counterterrorism and Middle East wars to great power rivalries akin to the 19th century, and largely, I think that the subtext of this is that we cannot do both because the U.S. military, if it's going to really go after great power strategy, it needs different kind of weaponry. It needs different kind of deployment. For instance, CENTCOM, CENTCOM replaced uh, uh, Be Belgium-based uh, uh, Supreme Allied Command as the most important command. I think in the ne next number of years, PACOM is going to become far more important than CENTCOM. And, you know, as we saw with the deal with Australia, you need different kinds of weaponry for high seas against the Chinese than for combating uh, terrorism. And you cannot be pouring billions of dollars into the Middle East if you're going to be fighting that war. So, so I think that's right now the, the sort of direction. It's not that America is becoming pacifist. Uh, or that, or that America is backing away from wars. It's just backing away from wars in the Middle East, uh, and and it's actually embracing confrontation in Asia. But it needs a very different kind of weaponry and 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 the like. And you know, when when you traveled until 
to, to Southeast Asia, their, their argument always was that you keep talking about containing China and you're talking about being in Asia, but all of your assets are in the Middle East. You have hardly any presence here militarily. And I think that's really shifting. And, and, I, and I don't see the momentum of that really easily changing. Um, go ahead, Robin. Sorry, sorry, Robin, I was gonna prompt you there, yeah. So I, I wanna make two points. One is that uh, the common denominator, whether you have a Republican or a Democrat in the White House, is that at the end of the day, whatever they say about the Middle East, they really ultimately prefer stability and kind of the reliable interlocutor rather than kind of a democratic opening that that creates a lot of different voices and is much messier when it comes to doing deals. So when we look for stability, we end up talking to those who can deliver for us, whether they're kings or um, princes or dictators. Uh, and, and that's the danger because that then spawns the kind of cycle that leads to resentment. Uh, and jihadism. The one thing we haven't talked about is that the Middle East has more failed or failing states today than at any time since the Arab-Israeli conflict began, since any of the Arab countries became independent. It's just staggering that Lebanon, which was the first democracy in the Middle East um, among the Arab states, is today a failing state where 90% of the currency has been devalued, where you know people are getting out as fast as they can, where um, there are electricity blackouts that dominate the day. This is it's just you know, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya. I mean, just everywhere you look, there um, there are huge challenges. But to Diwali's point, I want to add one thing, and that is that in the 21st century, we're still defining our conflict and our competition in terms of the kind of power that is in the tools of war, whether it is the B-52 bomber or the number of tanks, artillery, uh, drones, and so forth, when the, the real tool of the 21st century that the Chinese are becoming masters at is cyber. And I think that we're again locked in the past, whether it's in the Middle East or the kind of competition and conflict that we face, and that we're not, this is again where it takes more imagination, it takes new tools, it takes new institutions, it takes more creative thinking to, to to be ahead of the game rather than constantly responding. We're behind China. Who would have thought you know, China would be at a point 50 years ago that it would have this, whether it's economic power, military power, political leverage, um, that it is you know, the thing that we, we are concerned about the most. So I, you know, I worried a lot of letter, le levels that were just sucked into where we were before and that we, at, at whether it's the, the diplomatic level, the military level, and that we're not, we're not putting ourselves in a place that we can tackle all the issues that are ahead of us. I think, I think that's a really fair point. And I try to do this exercise with myself when I, you know, when you kind of re read your emails and you, and you get these statements from you know, whatever meeting between, you know, Secretary Blinken and President Biden with various Middle East leaders, like, are you ever surprised by the readout that comes out? You're never really surprised. It's still sort of this, and, and it's almost really the same, you know, across administrations as well. So I want to invite you to, I don't know how productive this is going to be, but how would we reimagine what a new relationship would be like a new re a relationship that is not sort of uh is not limited and restricted to this box or lens that we are so used to um thinking about whether it is to deal with militancy or with the failed states or with autocrats or the various sort of civil 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 crises that are going on in these countries like is there a reimagined way in which american diplomacy can be seen as actually a force for good and less a force of hypocrisy. We can think about that for a little bit. <laughs> but if anyone has any thoughts, I'd be curious to hear them. Well, I think we still have a few positive things to recommend us, although not as many as we used to. But in terms of our academic institutions, 
uh, and our science. And I think we should be promoting and our culture in terms of artistic uh, product. I think we should, we should be promoting that much more than we do. Um, uh, certainly inviting more students to come. Uh, uh, you know, obviously vaccine diplomacy is, is very important. I don't think it's lost on anyone that the Chinese vaccine doesn't seem to work. Uh, there are lots of reports of Iranians going to Armenia and other places to get Pfizer. Uh, and, and we see that the government has just agreed to let American, manuf well, no, American vaccines, but manufactured in Europe, uh, come to Iran because the Chinese, the Chinese stuff doesn't work. Um, the Chinese model looked very, very good for a very long time, but it's a little rocky now too. If, if you see what Xi Jinping is doing to his tech barons and to freedom of expression, in China, uh, his efforts to kind of make himself into a new Mao. So I think we do have a story to tell, but um, you know, obviously we have problems too. I don't know how many of you were listening to Raisi's speech at the UN, but you know, he referred to the US losing credibility both at home and abroad. He began with January 6, and then he talked about the, the people hanging onto the tires and falling off the planes as we had our disastrous exit from Afghanistan. So. You know, pictures like that and incidents like that obviously don't help. But I think still our universities, our culture, our science, these are the things, the freedom to create and to speak uh, that, that are still give us an edge, I think, for a lot of people in the Middle East. It's why people keep trying to come here from every country on the planet. And if there's a way we can put more money into promoting these kinds of things, um, uh, you know, obviously that would be, I think, a no brainer. Uh, we'll see. I mean, Samantha Power is pretty powerful at, at USAID. Maybe she has some bright ideas. Can I, can I weigh in? I, I, I have to say, I, uh, you know, we have a story to tell for sure. Uh, frankly, it's going to take generations to build, to, you know, create gen the group of young people who, who move into positions of power and make decisions about. The United States. Remember that many in the Iranian Revolution were educated at uh, Berkeley and MIT. So that's no, no guarantee. But I think one of the, the, the much greater dangers is that that the battlefield of the future is in, in, in the field of information and the digital age. And the, and the fact is we don't control the information that gets out there anymore. Uh, that many of the dictators are, notably Xi Jinping, but Vladimir Putin as well, are uh, restraining access to the free flow of information, access to the internet. And it's going to be much harder, I think, to, to advertise or win over others when they don't even know what we're about or what we've achieved or um, what opportunities we provide. Fair enough. Um, so with, with that um, really uh, positive note, I'm just, before I hand it over to questions, I did want to um, sort of do a bit of a, a very, a very quick lightning round, which is a bit, uh, shouldn't have said that, um, a lightning round of um, sort of the big challenges that the U.S. is immediately right now facing, facing in the middle, facing in the Middle East. If you could, I mean, not to kind of um, re reduce, reduce, reduce all of them. They're all, they're all pretty massive. But setting aside um, just the the Iran issue, because we've talked about it, um, we've talked about it pre uh, pretty extensively. Where do you sort of see the flashpoints that? you would hope the administration wouldn't be taken by surprise if they do flare up. Uh, again, Vali, do you wanna start us off there? Well, uh, you know, that's a difficult uh, question because there are so many of them. I, I, I think what Robin said about, you know, the number of failed states, uh, the number of fragile states uh, in, in a region that is not economically growing, uh, that as uh, you know has a massive youth population is facing water shortage climate challenges uh, you know in other words uh, the middle east is 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 a cauldron of instability and it's not only one or two places you could basically put your finger in the plug and say that that it's going to work and we don't have a solution for these uh, and and uh, and then as we've discussed we're caught between whether we rely on local dictators to just maintain stability, or are we going to aspire to something bigger, which we haven't been able to, to deliver? 
So, so I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, we can maybe try to avert the worst and find ways to protect ourselves. But I think that the, the goals of have, you know, being contributing to a much better region is a little bit out of our reach right now, especially because we don't even have ideas about what we want to do. If I can just add to what Vali said, I'm, I'm worried about Saudi Arabia. Um, I, you know, I've not been impressed by the judgment of Mohammed bin Salman, and I think he faces a lot of opposition within the country from, particularly from members of the royal family who've been shunted aside, all these various princes and so on. Uh, yes, he's, he's introduced a few reforms that have been popular with the younger generation, but um, I, I don't think we can be sure that he is going to become the king. Uh, I don't think we can be sure of stability there. And of course, Saudi Arabia is, is such an important country that we, we have to wish it well, uh, despite the mistakes that, that he has made. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Robin? Sure, well, if we were creative, and if we looked at the region honestly, we would be thinking less about how many troops we have, whether it's 10 or 1,000 or 50,000, and look instead at what economic leverage we have to help create jobs, to incorporate the young into societies, rather than to allow them to be so alienated and kind of drifting that they end up joining extremist movements. Uh, and this is where, you know, they, the Arab Spring was so hopeful in terms of showing that the young understood that rights were essential and that they were brave enough to stand up to some of the dictators to try to achieve them. The problem is they were young without the networks, the resources, the maturity of, 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 of in politically to create alternatives. And this is where if we could think about something when we talk about national security in terms beyond our military might or our military deployments, I think we might be able to address the, the real needs of the region uh, and up, you know, prevent some of the problems, whether it's the huge migrations, the, the uh, ex waves of extremism, uh, the, the, you know, help them through education and everything else, you know, address some of these environmental issues that will plague them, that will create new, trigger new conflicts in the region. I just think this is where uh, we don't have the self-confidence or creativity to think, think about beyond, you know, ensuring that we can protect our borders. And that I think is, is going to, to hurt us long-term. So one more question before um, I, I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, to questions, but you know, I, and this is indicative again of how the region has changed so much in the fact that we haven't, you know, we haven't at all discussed um, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, which you know, as you're all very familiar with, was you know once upon a time sort of the the issue and. Um, over the years um, is, is sort of ha has kind of, you know, is, is, is this issue that successive U.S. administrations have tried um, to come up with solutions, some might say more creative than others, um, but none that have been obviously particularly successful. And I'm more interested, um, you, you know, to, to, to talk about this from the U.S. side of things, uh, and particularly with this administration, and particularly with uh, sort of what I would sort of characterize as uh, the beginning of a change in tone of what we're seeing, um, especially from the, you know, progressive side of the Democratic Party, um, in terms of um, this, the, you know, and how they characterize um, U.S. support for Israel. So my question is, and, and Israel, of course, uh, for better or for worse, is just always going to be obviously a central pillar um, of, of, the, of U.S. national security interests um, in, in the region. Do you see um, that this, what was once sort of like this bedrock and cornerstone of unequivocal uh, U.S. support for the security of Israel, is that shifting in any way? Is it shifting in any meaningful way that will impact 
again the 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 alliances that we're seeing in the region or is this just sort of noise that we're hearing here in 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 washington um but that really doesn't kind of rise to the point of uh, creating any actual rupture between um the us and israeli uh re relationship fundamentally um valley do you want to go Sure. I mean, uh, you know, the bottom line is this, that Israel is not a foreign policy issue for the U.S. It's a domestic politics issue. And even the, def the, the way you define national security uh, uh, is obviously highly charged within America's domestic politics. And it's not about the, uh, the traditional, say, communities that we associated with supporting Israel in the 1960s, 70s, etc. Now it's a cause celeb for evangelicals and the conservatives based on the Republican party. And uh, that's where the biggest sort of support is. Uh, now, now that's, not, that's not changing. I don't see any, see any indication of that changing. Uh, in fact, the, 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 pro the progressive youth side of uh, challenging uh, America's alliance with Israel is, is just something new, but I, I think it's too marginal. Now, Israel is a very powerful force. It has its, its security sets of issues. Um, but even if the United States leaves the region, uh, I, I don't think that, the, that, the, that the, the, the constituents in the United States that are attached to, to unwavering American support for Israel are going to change. And, and you know, when we, we saw this, when the prime minister of Israel, uh, you know, felt perfectly comfortable undermining an American president, uh, without any kind of a pushback from either party, he just suggested to you that this is a kind of, he had domestic kind of power in America. This was not about national security. This was about the fact that, that, uh, that within the U.S. Congress and within large constituencies, Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu felt like he's like a very powerful American politician, almost, that could challenge the President of the United States on, on an important issue. So, so that, so I think that's Israel is a unique case. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to change. Robin, thoughts? That's an easy one. It's not going to change. Uh, okay. This is something that, you know, and the, and the tragedy is that the the issue that defined the region for so long, as you pointed out, Arab these Arab Palestinian conflict, that has no, no hope of any kind of resolution anytime soon. Both sides are stuck. Palestinian leadership is getting old and. Um, and without a clear kind of uh, guide to how it moves forward either. And so uh, the, the, the real tragedy in the Middle East is that the Palestinians are once again the forgotten people. Barbara, anything to add to that? Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Fair, fair enough. Robin and fair, enough. fair enough. All right, well, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was a really uh, great discussion. I know we have quite a few questions, so I'll hand it over to Warwick. Terrific, thank you, Yara. Um, I think we'll probably have time just to get to one, but uh, the one question uh, really does kind of bring us back to the topic at hand about you know 20 years after September 11th. And, and the question is, now that the U.S. has withdrawn from Afghanistan, do you think there's an increased chance of an attack on American soil or at a U.S. embassy or consulate by any group in the Middle East? And that can be anyone. I'm happy to take that one. Uh, I absolutely think that there is a danger. I don't think it's likely to be a 9-11 attack. I think both the FBI and the CIA have defined the kind of dangers. Uh, it's, it's been true for decades that American diplomats, American military facilities are the uh, easier targets. So we're soft targets, whether it's taking Americans hostage, uh, we still have an American who is a hostage in Afghanistan, that all the discussions we had with the Taliban and we left one American behind. Uh, I mean, others as well, but this is someone we knew was a, was a hostage. So I think that's the kind of threat and that we are more likely uh, to face down the road. I think also the, the thing to remember is that, that so many of the extremists or terrorist groups have been far more imaginative than we have. Uh, as the saying goes, you know, they only have to succeed once we have to succeed every time in, in countering them. 
but whether it's using other weapons, whether it's chemical weapons, biological weapons, even on a small scale, that psychological damage would be huge. And of course, terrorism really at the end of the day is all about your psychological impact because they're never going to defeat us, but they can certainly um, make us more vulnerable and, and change our societies as we've seen so fundamentally since 9-11. And we do have one other question that I'll, I'll try to get to if, if no one else has anything to say on that particular topic. Um, Paul Marx had, had just asked, uh, what is Russia's ultimate goal in their foreign policy with the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and its reduced influence in Syria? I think Barbara wants Bali to take it. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll start it and then I'll let Bali finish it. Um, First of all, I think they, they have enjoyed our humiliation given what happened to, to them. Uh, but they, uh, they don't wanna see Islamic fundamentalism spread into Central Asia and, and certainly not into the Caucasus. So I think they're very, uh, they're very wary of, uh, of the situation and um, uh, will want to do what they can to try to insulate themselves and their neighbors from the contagion of not just the Taliban, but other jihadist groups. And forgive me, somebody is pinging me. <laughs> Vali, over to you. I, I think it's, it's, it's complicated. It's, it's multi-layered. Definitely the, the, the fear of Islamic fundamentalism and, and jihadism is one reason they're involved in Afghanistan or they got involved in Syria. In the first place, uh, in the Persian Gulf, they have oil and gas interests. They have this partnership with Saudi Arabia to maintain the price of oil. Uh, uh, with Iran, they have a, a, a deeper sort of strategic uh, relationship that they built that allows them to project power in, in, in various arenas. So the Russians see themselves as a great power. And in the vacuum of the Middle East, they are exercising that. Uh, they, they use Syria to barter over uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, they're, they're hoping to sell weapons in the region. Uh, uh, it, it, in other words, it's not, you, cannot, you cannot reduce it to one. I think they, they want to have relations with everybody and try to see where, where they can protect their interests and where they can uh, leverage uh, uh, taking advantage of what we're leaving behind. Thank you for that. And with the remaining minute, uh, of course, all the questions now come in at the end. Um, uh, see one that's uh, asking for you to address the likely role of China in the Middle East. And of course, we know China has been a player in the Middle East for quite some time. But, um, you know, of course, you know, any of you who want to take that question, and, and that includes you, Yara, uh, feel free. I mean, all I'll say is, um, and I'm sure I, I think the panelists would agree, is that I, I mean, the the what the, the, the dynamic that I found really interesting is how um, countries in the re in the region in the Middle East and like we're actually now seeing play out with Europe have like really don't want to get sucked into this U.S. China rivalry and for uh, quite a while now have been cementing their own um, sort of. A, you know, lucrative commercial relationships, their diplomatic outreach um, with China and China, and again, and China, and and to you know, and the U and U and the U.S.'s um, when they make their concerns known to these countries, uh, generally they tend to fall on deaf ears because a lot of these countries, and especially again, given how the U.S. has has acted in the region over the last um, twenty years or so. Uh, you know, they again, it goes back to this issue of credibility and reliability as an ally. And why would you as a country uh, sort of put, you know, put all of your eggs in one in one basket, so to speak. And so and China, I think, has been able to utilize that to to very to very great effect without really much cost um, on its side as well. And I think we will sort of see a continuation um, of that of that sort of strategy. Anyone else on that subject? I weigh in on that. I, I think that one of the things that's so different about China and Russia are their tactics in the region. Russia is using the same kind of raw military approach that the United States has. It has, whether it's setting up an air, air, air force base in, uh, or a naval base in Syria, dispatching Russian mercenaries to Libya, it has a presence now on the Mediterranean. And that again is kind of the 
conventional way, the kind of even the holdover from the Cold War rivalry with the uh, United States or Western influence. Um, it's it's spreading its tentacles, uh, whether it's through Europe or um, with Ukraine or uh, in, in the Middle East uh, along the Mediterranean. China is taking a very different tact. It's looking economically and it's uh, offering deals to countries and uh, doing something that's uh, it's tragically um, sucked a lot of countries in, whether not just in the Middle East, but uh, around the world, especially developing countries where they offer them packages of development packages that create real debt among some of these countries. And then what they end up building is inferior and doesn't really provide the, the sophisticated infrastructure that, uh, that a lot of these countries want. And, and yet they're still in debt to China. And so they have to go along with what China wants, whether it's you know, at a UN vote or um, uh, just making sure that their relations are deep with Beijing. Um, in some cases more than Washington. So uh, it's the comp kind of competition among the great powers there. Everybody's using different tools and I'm not sure that we're as effective in countering either Russia or China. I think uh, we're gonna have to end on that note unless anyone has anything else to say. Um, I do wanna thank you, uh, all four of you. This has been such a comprehensive and illuminating discussion just as we knew it would be because the four of you were participating. So I really do wanna thank you on behalf of the Aspen Institute and the Society of Fellows for taking the time to be with us this evening. Um, I also wanna give a special thanks to Danny Seabright. He's an SOF member who was to have hosted our program here in Washington at the St. Regis. And we appreciate his generous support and look forward to another opportunity to gather in person here. Um, I also wanna make sure our members know that it's a, another foreign policy program on Tuesday in Los Angeles. Uh, featuring Ben Rhodes and Corey Shockey. Uh, they're going to be talking U.S. foreign policy as well, so we're looking forward to that. And then, of course, we're in San Francisco the next week talking about disinformation, and in New York the following week uh, with Chef Danny Meyer, Chef J.J. Johnson, uh, talking about the future of food and restaurants. So uh, a lot coming up, but in the meantime, uh, I hope all of you continue to stay safe and healthy, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much.